Hey, and welcome back. In keeping with last episode's theme, we'll be looking into more ghost dates from the US. For those of you who missed out, you can view that episode by clicking on the card above me, it should be there, or use the link in the description below. Just a quick recap though, a ghost date is, well, a proposed date that for one reason or another just didn't make the final cut, at least not yet. Oh, and for any viewers from the US, happy 4th! As always, if you've got an interest in history, forgotten or otherwise, feel free to subscribe down below and set the bell for all notifications so you never miss out on another episode. We cover a little bit of everything here on the channel now, and with that said, let's get to it! Okay, so when talking about Idaho, I mentioned something known as the panhandle. It's this thing, right here. This. Well, Idaho isn't the only state that's got one. You've got Alaska, Florida, Texas, Maryland, Nebraska, West Virginia, even tiny Connecticut. But perhaps the most iconic of the panhandles is that of Oklahoma. And for a period of about five years in the latter half of the 19th century, there was a grassroots movement aiming to get this little strip of land recognized as its own distinct territory, known as Cimarron. Our story begins back in 1885, when the US Supreme Court ruled an area some 34 miles wide and 169 miles long didn't belong to the nearby Cherokee outlet, which in turn brought in a massive influx of homesteaders from Kansas who settled along the Beaver River. They soon established a small town, which they called Beaver, but the problem was, they weren't the only ones in the area. Because it didn't belong to any state or territory per se, the area quickly became a refuge for outlaws, and in the words of Acting Interior Secretary LQC Lamar, was subject to squatters' rights. Thousands flooded into the lawless no man's land, and without legal backing for their land claims, law enforcement, or, well, laws, settlers often found themselves in a very insecure position. Seeking to address this, a bill was introduced that would have seen the territory added to Kansas, but it was vetoed by President Grover Cleveland. Then, on August 26, 1886, 30 men led by Dr. Owen G. Chase met in Beaver City. They proposed setting up a territorial government, and early the following year elected three councilmen. Shortly after this, it was announced the territorial government would, in due time, become a state government, the state of Cimarron. The self-declared territorial government soon drafted a petition that was sent to Washington, asking the federal government for recognition, a land office, a proper survey, and a federal court. Proclaiming that Cimarron had some 10,000 residents who needed government protection, and therefore they had formed their own, the petition was introduced to Congress, but ultimately was tabled and died. In 1888, the people of Cimarron faced hard times brought on by drought and crop failure. Plans to be annexed by New Mexico and or attached to the future Oklahoma Territory also went nowhere, or at least they seemed to be going nowhere. A territorial council was called later that year, which aimed to establish an elected Senate, House, and Supreme Court, provide for a presidentially appointed governor, secretary, justices, attorney, marshal, and place the territorial seat of government at Beaver, pending the approval or disapproval of Cimarron citizens. Plans were also set in motion to create a territorial seal as well. However, only 13 of the 23 legislators attended. Things quickly fell apart after this, and by 1890, thousands of the region's residents had left. Those who remained found a bit of relief, sort of, when the territory was attached to Oklahoma in May of that year. Staying with Oklahoma, we have another lost state, Sequoia. When Cimarron was incorporated in 1890, it wasn't attached to an actual state just yet, but rather the territory of Oklahoma. The eastern portion of what is today the state of Oklahoma was still then Indian Territory. And it was here that many Native American tribes, the Cherokee, Muscogee, or Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Seminole, the so-called Five Tribes, were forced to relocate from their homelands back east during the Trail of Tears. Now, on May 2, 1890, President Benjamin Harrison signed into law the Oklahoma Organic Act, which created the Oklahoma and Indian Territories. This was eventually followed by the Curtis Act of 1898 that, when considered alongside other initiatives, 
aimed to eliminate communal ownership of property and break up tribal governments in anticipation of the territories being admitted into the Union as one state. A number of tribal leaders were not exactly overjoyed about these developments, and so they decided to hold a convention in Muskogee on August 21st, 1905. Here, they drafted a constitution, drew up a plan for the organization of government, elected delegates, put together a map, and made their petition for statehood. Named in honor of a member of the Cherokee Nation, Sequoia, who in 1821 painstakingly built a syllabary for the Cherokee language still in use today, the proposal had overwhelming support from the local population, with a commanding majority of the roughly 65,000 voters favoring the plan. It failed to gain any traction in Washington, however, and the Indian Territory was later combined with Oklahoma, becoming the 46th state on November 16, 1907. But fast forward to 2020, and with the Supreme Court's ruling in McGirt v. Oklahoma, which among other things declared that much of eastern Oklahoma remains Native American land, the door seemingly has been reopened for revisiting other long-standing historical issues dealing with territorial rights. It's a long shot, but you never know. We may just yet see the state of Sequoia. Anyway, heading up north to the Midwest, we have the state of Superior. And when it comes to a possible contender for 51st state, move over DC and Puerto Rico, the people of Michigan's Upper Peninsula, the Youpers, aren't the least bit modest when it comes to picking a name for their proposed state. Now obviously, that's a joke, with the state of Superior getting its name from nearby Lake Superior, but the history behind why the UP feels alienated from the state's lower peninsula stretches back to at least the 1850s. Firstly, Michigan didn't really want the Upper Peninsula. Rather, what it wanted was a bit of land known as the Toledo Strip, now in Ohio. And its 24-year-old governor, Stevens T. Mason, actually fought a war of sorts in order to obtain it. There was only one military confrontation during this, the Battle of Phillips Corners, and no reported casualties, although a Michigan sheriff's deputy was later non fatally stabbed by an Ohioan. But the so-called Toledo War ended in a stalemate that leaned in Ohio's favor, and Congress proposed a compromise in which Michigan, then still a territory, would give up its claim to the Strip in exchange for statehood and the Upper Peninsula. Unhappy with the offer, it was initially rejected by members of a special convention held in Ann Arbor, but a year later, in 1836, finding itself in a deepening financial crisis and under considerable pressure from President Andrew Jackson, the proposal was accepted by members of the so-called Frostbitten Convention. And with that, the Toledo War came to an end and Michigan gained the Upper Peninsula. In the decades afterwards, however, the two halves of Michigan developed in very different ways, while the South became a center for heavy industry dotted with large cities like Detroit and Grand Rapids, the less populated North would have an economy centered on forestry and mining. As the mining industry declined in the later 20th century, many Upers came to feel as though their plight was being ignored by politicians down South. Moreover, the UP remained unconnected with the Lower Peninsula until 1957, when the Mackinac Bridge was completed. Even with this newfound connection though, Parts of the Upper Peninsula remained, for lack of a better word, disconnected simply because of distance. The city of Ironwood, for example, in the far west of the UP, is some 600 miles from Detroit. That's basically a 9 or 10 hour drive. As such, it's really not that surprising. Some came to believe a different arrangement would better serve regional interests. Fine. I'll do it myself. In 1858, a convention was held exactly for that purpose, seeking to combine the Upper Peninsula and Northern Wisconsin into a new state to be called either Superior or Antonagon. This basically was repeated in some form, again in 1897, 1959, and 1962. Although the push for statehood has cooled off a bit since the 1970s, there remains support for Superior even today, and you'll pretty regularly see bumper stickers, hats, and other items extolling the future 51st state when traveling through Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Lastly, we have West Sylvania. This is kind of a two-parter, because not only do you have a ghost state, but you've also got a ghost colony that preceded it. See, back in the 18th century, there were several attempts by the British to colonize the Ohio Valley, most notably in 1748, when the Crown granted a petition to the Ohio Company of Virginia for some 200,000 acres, or 800 kilometers squared, 
near what is now the city of Pittsburgh. These efforts were frustrated, though, by a series of Native American uprisings in the aftermath of the French and Indian War. But following some reorganization that saw land speculators from the Ohio Company, Walpole Company, and Indiana Company combined to form the Grand Ohio Company, they received a grant for a large tract of land on the Ohio River in 1772. Originally to be called Pittsylvania, after William Pitt, first Earl of Chatham, the name was later changed to Vandalia in honor of British Queen Consort Charlotte of Mecklenburg Strelitz, who was thought to have been a descendant of a Germanic people known as the Vandals. But all was seemingly for naught, because in 1775 you had the outbreak of the American Revolution, which put a premature end to any colonial ventures in the Ohio Valley. Or did it? Inspired by the ideals of the revolution, the people here soon declared their independence from Pennsylvania and Virginia, both of which maintained pre-existing territorial claims, and petitioned the Second Continental Congress to recognize what they soon called West Sylvania. By the way, the word Sylvania in West Sylvania comes from the word Sylvan, which means a pleasant, woodsy area. Anyway, the wannabe 14th state got a rather cool reception and during the latter stages of the War of Independence in 1780, Pennsylvania and Virginia settled their western boundary dispute. This, much to the outrage of some frontiersmen who more closely associated with Virginia, resulted in them now finding themselves living within Pennsylvania. And there rather suddenly was renewed interest in Westylvanian statehood, which the Pennsylvanian Assembly soon declared tantamount to treason and therefore subject to the penalty of death. Yeah, I, I don't think that's the case anymore, but, you know, don't push your luck if you're in Pennsylvania. But it was enough to silence those agitating for secession, bringing to an end the state that never was. Hey again, hope you guys enjoyed this dive into some states that could have been from the U.S. Given one or two events, you know, the map could have looked very differently. And I think it's a fascinating, if not overlooked, chapter from American history. Anyway, if you guys like this episode, there's plenty of other ghost states to cover, so, you know, let us know down below in the comments, and the same goes for ghost countries, as always. And, yeah, that's pretty much it. Peace.